Go with me in your Bibles this morning to Exodus chapter 31. You can use the Pew Bible there in front of you if you don't have yours with you. Exodus is not a hard book of the Bible to find, the second book of the Old Testament. And we'll be in chapter 31 this morning. Exodus chapter 31. And I'll begin reading in verse 1. Exodus 31, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to do work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Moreover, I have appointed Aholiab, son of Ahissamach of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given skill to all the craftsmen to make everything I have commanded you. Now, I know that might sound like a kind of an odd passage to be reading on a Sunday morning. So without a lot of context, it might be hard to understand what's going on here. So let me, let me tell you what, what leads up to Exodus 31. Moses is leading God's children out of the slavery that they had endured in Egypt for 430 years. He's leading that whole nation out of Egypt, sort of northeast into the, the area that we know today as Israel. He's leading them out, and as they're on their journey, God is giving Moses these very detailed instructions about how to construct this thing we call the tabernacle. Um, God wanted his people to have this portable, uh, kind of like a portable worship center, uh, as they're making their journey from Egypt to the promised land. He cared so much about his relationship with them that he wanted them to have this way to approach him, to worship him, to draw together, to, to, to honor him. He wanted them to have that experience even though they didn't have a home yet. They were, they were on this 40-year journey from Egypt to the promised land. So he's giving Moses these very... Detailed, And if you've ever come across this section in your Bible reading, you know that it's very detailed, right? He talks about the, the length of the cloth, ex exact measurements, and the, the type of cloth to use. He, he gives him instructions about this, this altar where they were going to slaughter animals and offer the burnt offerings. Um, there, there, there's this incense, and he gives them even the specific ingredients and recipes to make this incense that they were going to burn as part of the worship gatherings together. He gives them instructions about all of this furniture. There was so much, uh, you know, the, 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 the lampstand and the candlesticks and all of these things that were go going to go into the tabernacle. And he gives these detailed instructions about all of this. And I'm sure Moses, as he was writing all of this down, he was probably thinking, there's no way that I'm going to be able to, you know, he, Moses is kind of like the president of the nation. There's no way that he can just sit down at the loom and make all of this stuff and cut the gemstones and make all of these priestly garments and the vest. There, I'm sure he's thinking, there's no way that I'm going to be able to, how am I going to construct this big tabernacle, this portable worship center? And so then comes Exodus chapter 31, and God tells Moses, listen, I have given gifts to these two men, Bezalel and Aholiab, and they are going to do this work. They're going to, to, to uh, manage this project, to supervise this. They're going to train other people. Uh, we see in chapter 35, they're, they're, they're training other people also to do this. So this wasn't just some little this wasn't like a, a, a tent that you might see at a cross-country meet, and they would just set it up in the middle of the, of the camp. I mean, this was immaculate. This was a massive tent. This was a thing of beauty. The furniture was overlaid in gold. And, and so God gives gifts to these two men, Bezalel and Aholiab, to, to, uh, to construct this. this. This was probably already part of their career. Remember, they were slaves, all of these people, two million of them, they were slaves in Egypt. And so it could have been that as a slave, these two men, that was, their, that was their job, that was their career. Maybe they worked in textiles or maybe they cut gemstones, but God had given them these gifts and they were going to be the ones to construct this tabernacle. They would be the ones to, to do the, all of the artistic designs. And so with that in mind, all of that context of where we are, look back with me at verse 1, uh, Exodus chapter 31. The Lord said to Moses, 
See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts. Notice the, the language here. God says, I have chosen. I, he says, I have chosen Bezalel. I have filled him with my Spirit. I have given them these skills and these, uh, these abilities to do this. God had specifically chosen them for this career. This was going to be part of their career on this 40-year journey through the wilderness. People had careers, okay? This wasn't just some, you know, camping trip where people were going out for the weekend. They, this was, they, people had careers. This was a nation of, uh, you know, as I said, probably about 2 million people. So they had to, people had to be in charge of waste management and transporting water and you know, metal smithing and military training. They had to do all kinds of stuff as they're on their journey. And this was going to, going to be part of their career. God even says in verse 3 there, I have filled him with the Spirit of God for this task. Now, let me ask you, when you think of someone being filled with the Spirit of God to do something, what do you normally think of? Because I normally think of things that happen in, in a church context, right? I think about ministry within the church, that people are filled with God's spirit to, to, to minister, to teach, to preach, to serve others. I think about what I'm doing right now, that God has uh, put this message in me and he's uh, empowered me by his Holy Spirit to communicate his word. Or maybe you think of all of us worshiping together, singing, just our, our voices in unison, singing praises to God. And maybe you think of that's, that's how we experience the filling of the Holy Spirit when we're worshiping together as God's people. Or maybe you think of using your spiritual gifts, the, the things that God has enabled you to do, using those to serve others. All of those we need the filling of the Holy Spirit of God to do. Yes, th that is all true. I need God's Holy Spirit to do what I do. You need God's, the filling of God's Holy Spirit to serve others and do what you do. And God's Spirit fills us and is present with us as we worship him. But also, it, according to the Bible, God filled these men with his Holy Spirit, but not to preach, not to be worship leaders. He filled them with his Holy Spirit to do textile work to cut gemstones, to, to, to construct this, to do kind of like project management as they were in charge of this, in charge of this uh, construction project. Um, Bezalel and Aholiab were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. We might not think of that as very spiritual, but God's Spirit filled them to do woodworking, to, do, to work with crafts, even to do artistic design. Look again at verse 4. Verse 4 says, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. So we see here that even artistic ability is men specifically mentioned as a gift from God. Do you think of someone's artistic ability as being a gift from God, that God's Holy Spirit fills someone to be able to produce art? Well, that's what it says here. Uh, we see here that woodworking is a gift from God. They were filled with the Spirit of God to do woodworking. Later on, we see that they were going to have the kind of uh, apprenticeships. In, in chapter 35, they were going to teach others to do the same thing, and this was also a gift from God. Now, those skills, working with your hands, textile work, cutting gemstones, uh, teaching others, doing on-the-job training, we might not think of those as very spiritual. We might think of those as, you know, we, the spiritual stuff happens here inside this building. And then what we're doing tomorrow at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that's something different. But no, God's Holy Spirit filled them to do what we would consider mundane things, woodworking and textile work. This was part of the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. They, they were filled with God's Holy Spirit to produce art, to sew cloth, to cut gemstones and all of the rest. Here's, here's the main point that I want you to see this morning. All of that context and all of that to say this. What I want you to remember this morning is that your vocation, what you do for a living, matters to God. What, what you do in your 40-hour-a-week job, that's not unspiritual. 
That matters to God. God has given you the abilities and talents that you use in your career. And that's not, that's not something that's kind of separate from your life with God. God has given all of us certain skill sets and knowledge that you use in your career. And he glorifies himself, blesses you, and blesses those around you through what you do for a living. What you do for a living matters to God. The abilities that you use. Maybe you're a full-time student. Maybe you have a part-time job and you're a student. Maybe you have a, a, a regular full-time job. You're well into your career. Maybe you're retired and you have a second career. You're doing something else. But all of those skills that God has given you, those matter to him. God is, God is pleased in our work. Our work matters to God. I think about all of, the, all of the vocations that are represented here in this room. We have people in the medical field. We have truck drivers. We have engineers. We have stay-at-home moms. We have people that are in retail and sales. Um, we have um, people that uh, are educators. We have business professionals, people that work in finance. Uh, we have students. We have soldiers in our congregation, people in manu manufacturing. We have musicians. All of that talent, and just think about all of the knowledge and talent that is represented here in this room. And the Bible says that those are not just skills that I've developed on my own, not just something that I picked up from teachers or my parents. Those are gifts from God. The, the, the gift, to, I crunch numbers for a living. That is, according to the Bible, something that God has enabled me to do. Maybe you teach for a living. Maybe you, whatever it is you do for a living, those are gifts from God. God has given to you to glorify him. That's not unspiritual. God cares about your job. Um, the Bible has so much to say about work and vocation. Let me, let me just mention to you just a few things walking through Scripture about what the Bible says about work career, vocation, because I think in our minds we might think of that as something separate from my life with God. But no, God, that, that's something that's a gift from God. Work, I don't know if you knew this, but work existed in the Garden of Eden before sin did. Work was part of paradise before sin came into the world. I don't know if you've noticed that as you've, if you've read through Genesis, but we might, I think some people might have this misunderstanding that Adam and Eve were just kind of chilling in the garden, you know, toes in the water, toes in the sand all day long. And then once they sinned, okay, God says, now you're going to work. That's your punishment. That's, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that they were working even in paradise, even before sin. It was agricultural work, but God had given them work to do. We get to Exodus chapter 20, and God is giving them the Ten Commandments. And God says, okay, just like I worked for six days and rested on the seventh day, that's what I want you to do. It's a command to work, rest, work, rest. And, and I know that we, not, not all of us have that kind of schedule. We have swing shifts and third shifts and all kinds of rotating schedules, but that's the, that's the pattern that God has given us. Work, rest, work, rest, because that's what he did. He worked and then he rested. Uh, the book of Proverbs, man, there is so much career advice just in that one little book. There's probably more career advice just in the book of Proverbs than in any other book of the Bible. Um, you know, it talks about leadership skills. It talks about um, hard work. It talks about laziness. It talks about developing the skills, being good at what you do in your 40-hour-a-week job, being, being good at what you do. It even talks about Making a profit and building wealth. Those are not bad things. Those are not unspiritual things, according to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs encourages us to make a profit, not to hoard wealth, but to build wealth that benefits others around us, that benefits, our, that benefits future generations. Uh, the, the passage that Pastor Andrew read a few minutes ago, it's praising this woman, probably an imaginary woman, but what is she praised for? She's praised for her character, and her career, her work, both inside the home and outside the home. Both of those are, are praised there in, in Proverbs chapter 31. And I've, 
I've tried to remind our youth and my daughters of this. Listen, let's not, uh, let's not imbibe this, this worldly mindset that a job that earns a paycheck is more valuable than a job that doesn't earn a paycheck. The, the Bible, that's, not a, that's not a biblical worldview. The Bible, uh, the Bible extols and recommends both. And that's what this woman in Proverbs 31 is praised for, her hard work, her career. Um, she probably didn't work simultaneously, all of that inside the home and outside the home. It's probably a lifetime of work, but that's what she is praised for. Um, now, here's something that's really interesting to me. We get to the book of Daniel. And you remember the story of Daniel, the lion's den, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, Daniel chapter 1 says that God gave Daniel and his friends knowledge in literature. Now, you might think that you might think I hated literature class whenever I was growing up, but th that's what they needed to know. Daniel was a career political advisor. He needed to be able to know the wisdom of the ages in order to make good decisions and to advise the king. And so the Bible says that God gave Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knowledge in literature so that they could carry on their, they could be good at this career in politics that God had called them to. The Apostle Paul, we think of him as a missionary, but he was actually what we would call a bivocational minister. His day job was making tents, and that allowed him to be a missionary. So Paul worked hard. He even talks about how, you know, I didn't try to accept any offerings from you. I paid my own way. I bought my own food. Paul worked hard. Uh, he tells the believers in Ephesians chapter 4, talking about our day jobs, that we are to work as if we're working for the Lord and not just for our employer. We're, we're to, those of us who are followers of Jesus are to consider God as our ultimate employer, as if we were working for him. He told the Thessalonian believers that those who don't work should not eat. So work is praised and extolled all throughout Scripture, even in the Garden of Eden, even in paradise. And I have no reason to believe that we won't work in heaven. Um, it, you know, work wasn't part of the curse. It was just that it became more frustrating and more difficult. And those of you who are students or you're in a job, you know, I'm, I'm sure you understand how frustrating and difficult that can be. Well, that was what was part of the curse, not, not the work itself. Um, work was, was as part of the Bible all the way through. And even Jesus in his prayer in John 17, he said, Father, I have accomplished the work that you have given me to do. So even the gospel was accomplished through the work that Jesus did. Work is, is mentioned and praised and encouraged all throughout Scripture. The Bible doesn't present work as just this necessary evil that we have to live with, this ball and chain that I have to drag around just so that I can get to my real life or just so that I can en enjoy the weekend. No, work is, is presented as uh, uh, one of God's good gifts to us. It's what we were designed to do. Even in paradise, we were designed to work. That's one of God's good gifts to us. Now, some of you this morning are, are students. So let's just say high school students. You're, you're probably starting to, to discover the things that, that you're good at. You're probably starting to discover the things that you, you have talents for these specific things that other people may not have. Um, I, I think of the things that I see James Green post on Facebook that he, that he makes at RD. Man, he's got some talent in culinary design. That's, that's something that I, a talent I certainly don't have. Um, but man, he's very talented. I've, I've talked with David Ward about the things that, are, that he's interested in. David Ward has built his own computer. How many of you have built your own computer? That's a, a talent that, that is going to be very, very valuable. I mean, I think about what I do for a living. I could not do what I do without people in IT making the, the, the programs and developing and maintaining them so that I can do my job. That's a, a great talent to have. Um, so I would encourage you, those of you who are in, in high school, you're starting to discover the things that you're good at. Um, I, I hope that as you, as you anticipate a career, as you look forward to how God is going to enable you to do those things, um, you probably hear a, 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 a phrase, follow your passions. And that's really not good career advice. I mean, you're probably, just ask any adult in this room if you love every single thing you do every day of the week. We don't love everything we do. Um, 
You might have to just do something that you're not necessarily wild about, and then maybe some, some passion that God has given you is a side gig. But I would say the, the, the better advice is follow God's leading, follow God's guide. It's not necessarily your own passions. Your own passions can make you frustrated about what you do. Follow God's leading um, and develop the skills that he's given you. Some of you in here are post-high school. So you're, you, maybe you're in college, maybe you're in gap year, maybe you went straight from uh, high school to your career. You know, you're like Sean Kemp going straight from high school to the NBA. You know, that's, that's an amazing uh, opportunity to be able to have. I talked to a guy just several months ago who's in that same boat, straight from high school to a career. Um, so you're kind of in that area of your life, post high school. Uh, you, you've, you've probably already kind of narrowed the field about what, how God has gifted you and enabled you, and you're, you're, you're probably on one certain career path. You might not be sure about what that looks like, but you're on that path. You might even be involved in like an apprenticeship or some kind of practicum. You already have one foot in another career, or like I said, you, you have both feet in, 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 a, in a career. What I would say to you as you're thinking about that career, that I hope you see your, what, you're, what you do for a living is not just a way to live independent, to uh, make money, to, uh, to, to have a real life. I hope you see your career as th this is an ability that God has given me to do. God has filled me with his Holy Spirit to, to do this, to teach students or to own my own business or to work in finance or whatever it is that God is leading you to do. I hope you see that that your career as something that is, that is a gift from God to you, not just a, a way to make money. Now, the majority of you in here, I would guess, are well into a career, uh, you know, first career, second career, whatever, I'm in a second career, whatever that might be. Some, a lot of us are already into that. Um, here's how I would challenge you. How would your work be different if you viewed that as God the Holy Spirit has filled me to do the work that I do. God the Holy Spirit has filled me to be in HR or to crunch numbers or to be in manufacturing. That is, God the Holy Spirit has enabled me to do that. How would our work be different if we saw that as God's gift, not only to us, but to glorify him and bless those around us? So I hope that tomorrow, afternoon at two o'clock when a lot of you are going to be at your job working. I hope you remember what the Bible says about, about work and about vocation and yes, even about building wealth that benefits you and that blesses your family and benefits those around you. I hope you see that in your relationships with your coworkers, God is accomplishing his work, the work of redemption. He can accomplish that through your work. So, so as you work hard, as you refrain from <laughs> talking about the boss behind his or her back, as you do your job, as you develop your skills, become more valuable to the company that you work for, and yes, as you bring a verbal witness of the gospel into your conversations with your coworkers, God is accomplishing his work, the work of redemption, through your work. I hope you view your job that way. Some of you are retired from one career. You may be in a second career or you may be retired. I hope you see that God has given you skills and abilities that he still wants you to use. God has not called any of us to a life of leisure. God has given us, th those, those jobs might be different. It might not be a 40-hour-a-week job, but God has given you skills and abilities. You can train another generation for a lifetime of work. That's what, those are the, the, the gifts God has given you. You can, you can pour into another generation. You can be an example of how the Bible speaks of a biblical theology of work and vocation to the next generation. So I want you to remember what you do for a living, what you will do for a living, what you're preparing to do, or what you do right now as a student. That is not accidental. It's not peripheral. It's not unspiritual. What you do for a living matters to God. It's not just a way to bide your time. It's not just a way to get to retirement. It's not just a way to pay off student loans or to enjoy real life on the weekends. No, what you do for a living, what you will do for about a fourth or a third of your life is not unspiritual. It is a gift from God. 
one of God's good gifts to his people. So let's, as, a, as brothers and sisters in Christ, let's purpose together to work hard tomorrow, not just right, in, right as we serve other people, but tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, let's purpose together to work hard to glorify God in our work. Because 1 Corinthians 10, 31, you know this verse, it says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Let's glorify God in the work that he has given us to do. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for how your word shows us not just the plan of redemption, not just as supremely important as it is for us to know who you are. That is the most important thing about your word, is seeing you, knowing who you are. You, you reveal that to us in your word. You reveal to us who we are in relation to you and the, the mess that we're in and how we need you. But Father, I think, thank you that you also talk about things as mundane as eating a meal, as drinking, as work what we do in our nine to five jobs. Thank you for this encouragement that you have gifted us and enabled us and even filled us with your spirit to do what we do whenever we're on the clock, to do the vocation that you have given us to do. And Father, I pray that you'd help all of us, all of us who are followers of Jesus, help us to see our vocations not as, as something that is just uh, kind of less important than what we do together as a congregation, but part of the good gift that you have given to your people so that we can glorify you and that we can bless others around us. Father, help us to glorify you in our work. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.